An introduction to critical care, presented by me, your host, Pat Nelligan. Welcome to the ICU. This is a series of introductory videos for those of you who are new to the ICU, whether you are doctors, nurses, medical students, or allied healthcare professionals. The first tutorial explains to you what critical care is. An introduction to critical care. Part one, what is critical care? In this tutorial, I will discuss critical care and intensive care units and the critical care team. Let's start with a scenario. Paddy, 73, is one of your patients and he has been admitted to critical care. What is critical care? Critical care wards are places in the hospital that are dedicated to the management of critically ill patients who either need intensive life-sustaining therapies such as mechanical ventilation, vasopressor drugs, they're drugs that restore the blood pressure back to the normal range, continuous kidney replacement therapy or mechanical support of the circulation. They may also be admitted to these units for intensive monitoring of blood pressure of the brain including the intracranial pressure of electrolytes etc. Not all patients admitted to critical care units are critically ill. Some of them, for example, may have had major surgery and they're being monitored for immediate complications of that surgery. Generally, critical care units have large bed spaces with a lot of room around the bed for things to be done to the patient, such as the insertion of lines and the placement of various machines. In this case, you can see that this patient has a monitor behind the bed, is attached to a mechanical ventilator on the right, and has multiple infusions running on the left-hand side of the screen. In order to achieve all of these interventions, it is essential that the critical care unit has lots of nurses. And critical care units can be defined by a high nurse to patient ratio. The availability of invasive monitoring and the use of mechanical and pharmacological life-sustaining therapies. Different types of patients go to the ICU, but they can be defined very simply as medical patients that may be adults or children that have illnesses or injuries that precipitate loss of physiologic reserves sufficient to keep the patient alive without support. In other words, the patient gets so sick that unless they receive life-sustaining therapies, they will die. They can also be surgical patients, either adults or children, who are post-op acute surgical injuries, such as trauma, a perforated viscous or an abdominal aortic aneurysm, or a brain injury, that requires monitoring and critical care, or they've had major surgery such as neurosurgery, or cardiac surgery, etc. The other group of patients that one will see in the ICU are obstetric patients. These are pregnant women who have medical or surgical complications of pregnancy, the poor period. Now there are different types of wards in hospitals and the relative ratio of nurses to patients really defines the level of care patients get in the hospital. So we refer to these wards by the level of care. Level zero is ward-based care, and there is a variable amount of nurses per patient, starting at perhaps one to six, one nurse to six patients, and going higher than that, depending on staffing models. Level one is where there is advanced ward-based care. This is, for example, like a PACU, a recovery room for extended periods after major surgery. And generally in those units, there is one to three or one to four nurse to patient ratio. Level two care is intermediate care. It's critical care. Sometimes these units are known as high dependency units. In the part of the world that I work in, there is a one to two nurse to patient ratio. Sometimes it's one to three, for example, in North America. Level three care is otherwise known as intensive care. These are intensive care units. In the UK and in Ireland, that's a one to one nurse to patient ratio. In North America, it may be a one to two ratio. It's characterized by the presence of an ICU consultant generally during the day and at night that is dedicated only to the care of those patients and there is a critical care team. So levels two and three are critical care units. 
Generally, the kind of therapies you can get in these units in level zero, oxygen and intravenous drugs. Level one, non-invasive ventilation such as CPAP, post-op or some vasopressor drugs for post-operative vasoplegia. In level two, that's the high dependency unit, there is advanced monitoring, arterial lines, for example, measuring blood pressure, central venous catheters, etc. And patients might get mechanical ventilation via a tracheostomy. Level three is where the really complex stuff goes on, intubation and mechanical ventilation, continuous kidney replacement therapy, and in some specialist units, intracranial pressure monitoring, intraortic balloon, counterpulsation, and then various mechanical assist devices for the heart, like ventricular assist devices, and extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, ECMO therapy that may only be available in just one hospital in an entire region or country. Generally, in level two units, there is single organ support, and in level three ICUs, there is multi-organ support. So if you look at this particular patient in this picture, what level of care do you think this patient is receiving? Well, you can see this patient is on a ventilator and is intubated with a monitor and multiple infusion. So this is intensive care. This patient is also receiving plasma exchange. Now within any hospital, there may be a variety of different critical care spaces. The operating rooms and the recovery room are critical care spaces. The ED resuscitation area is, the labor ward is, the coronary care is, the PACU or extended post-operative recovery unit is, the high dependency or intermediate care unit is, and of course the ICU is. Admission to one of the critical care units usually involves organ failure or physical derangements. And to keep this very simple, most of the time the patients are admitted with the following. Hemodynamic insufficiency manifest as hypotension, respiratory insufficiency manifest by hypoxemia and hypercarbia, and renal or metabolic failure resulting in fluid and electrolyte imbalance. And finally, brain insufficiency characterized by a deteriorating level of consciousness, seizure, or coma. Now, what we do in the ICU is we take patients from all kinds of areas in the hospital, from everything from oncology to dermatology to even psychiatry to the emergency room, medicine, surgery, etc. And we apply a limited number of interventions to an infinite number of diseases. Now, there are some disease syndromes that are commonly seen in the ICU. The most common, of course, is sepsis that evolves to septic shock and multi-organ failure. We also see other organ failures, for example, cardiogenic shock caused by myocardial infarction or cardiomyopathy or following cardiac arrest or cardiac tamponade, hypoxic respiratory failure that manifests as acute respiratory distress syndrome or airway obstructive disease caused by asthma or COPD or neoplasm or inhaled objects. Acute kidney failure, such as occurs acutely or acute on chronically, and that manifests with metabolic acidosis, fluid overload, and electrolyte abnormalities. Acute coma, which may be toxic, metabolic, ischemic, infectious, etc. And finally, metabolic and endocrine syndromes, such as diabetic ketoacidosis, thyroid storms, thyroid coma, adrenal crises, etc. Regardless, these patients end up in the ICU and they end up attached to the same monitors with similar devices attached to them, such as ventilators and dialysis machines, often receiving similar interventions. Who looks after the patient in the ICU? Well, that's the critical care team. And what we've learned over the last 40 years is the team is everything in the ICU. If you don't have a good functioning team, you don't have a good functioning ICU. The leaders of that team are from various different backgrounds. There's usually an ICU consultant who is known as an intensivist or intensive care specialist and an ICU nurse manager. They will report to a nursing administrator and a medical administrator, but while they're in the ICU, they run the place. There's an ICU medical team that will have several residents and perhaps fellows, ICU nurses who are super specialist nurses, an ICU pharmacist or a pharmacy team, a physiotherapy team, occupational therapists, dietitians, and speech and language therapists. And they all work together to manage the patients in the ICU, not necessarily all at the same time because patients have a different evolution to their care, but everybody's involved at different levels at different times in patient care in the ICU. Now let's look at the different systems 
of the body that we intervene with in the ICU. For example, in the neurological system, we sedate patients routinely in the ICU so that they're calm and they don't get upset and they're not traumatized by being in the unit. There are different levels of brain monitoring that we can also do and specific brain interventions. Commonly, and for most patients, respiratory monitoring and interventions are required, starting, for example, with oxygen therapy, going to high-flow oxygen therapy, to continuous positive airway pressure, mechanical ventilation, all the way down to weaning through a tracheostomy. In terms of cardiovascular interventions, we often have to give patients vasopressors. Occasionally, they'll require mechanical support of the circulation, for example, with intraortic balloon pumps. The cardiovascular system is intervened with by feeding the patient, usually by a tube feed, an enteral feed that goes into the stomach or post pylorically into the duodenum, or the patient may get intravenous feeding from total parental nutrition. In terms of the kidneys, normally we will give patients fluids. We replace their electrolytes very carefully and make sure that their electrolyte levels are within normal range. But some patients will require continuous kidney replacement therapy or intermittent hemodialysis. And then frequently they will require controlled de-resuscitation in the late stage of their illness. In terms of the endocrine system, we give patients insulin if their blood sugars are high, and then we sometimes give patients steroids or thyroid hormones, etc., if there is a problem with those different organ systems. Of course, the most common reason patients come to the ICU is with sepsis, and we give these patients fluid, vasopressors, control the source, and follow the patient through. That requires the precise administration of antimicrobials based on cultures and following the patient's labs and their clinical pattern and, if necessary, having surgeons involved in source control. But the most important intervention in the ICU, unquestionably, is the careful bedside nurse and the allied healthcare professionals. The job is to look after the patient while the therapies are working and prevent iatrogenic complications such as bacterial overgrowth, bed sores, myopathy, incorrect drugs, wrong drug dosing, gastropulmonary aspiration, etc. Remember, it's frequently iatrogenic complications that kills the patient. In most of the world, we call the unit that the patient goes into when they're really sick the ICU. For many years in the United Kingdom, they've used the term ITU. This is intensive care versus intensive therapy. I have to say I have a strong bias towards the former because most of the work that's being done in the ICU on a daily basis is performed by nurses and nurses are caring for patients. If you look at the workload of patients during their time in the ICU, it looks a bit like this. There's a huge amount of work in the first 24 hours and that's when the patient's in the ICU itself. Then subsequently, the workload drops off a bit where patients are recovering. They may have a secondary complication, so it may go up for a while, but generally things are favorable, and that happens likely in the high dependency unit, and then subsequently the patient goes out to the ward where they're still cared for, and then they go to rehab. The following is an illustration of the workloads of different healthcare providers in the ICU, but don't think for a second that the quantum is comparable between the groups as nurses provide the majority of care in the ICU. On the first day, the doctors are very busy putting in lines, assessing the patient, ordering and performing tests, starting medications, resuscitating the patients, etc. The nurses do an equivalent high level of work at this stage. Assuming that all is going reasonably well, day two, the medical workload drops a little, but the nursing workload is still very high, and you get a similar picture on day three. By day four, the patient should be beginning their recovery, so allied healthcare professionals will be getting more and more involved. And as you follow the patient out, after one week or so, most of the care in the ICU or high dependency units will be provided by nurses and allied healthcare professionals. That's physios, occupational therapy, speech therapy, dietitians, etc. So intensive therapy really is a misnomer of a term. Sure, that goes on, but most of the time that they are in critical care units, most patients are undergoing acute rehabilitation. Let's review this tutorial. In this tutorial, I discussed critical care units as a concept and the level of care and who works in the ICU, the critical care team, and the pattern of 
of what goes on in the ICU at different times. And I looked at the two terms that are commonly used, ICU versus ITU, and tried to explain why I think ICU is a better term. Next time, we'll move on and look at the critically ill patient. And I'm going to start with a discussion that I think is really important for understanding why some people become critically ill and others don't, and that is the concept of physiologic reserve. And then we're going to talk about risk factors for admission to critical care. I'll see you then, and I guarantee you'll learn something. So that's the end of the first video on what critical care is. Please follow these tutorials in sequence. If you're enjoying them, please subscribe, give me some likes and make some comments and introduce me to some good friends.